This is our fourth session now on Colossians 1, 9 to 12, and I'm wrestling in this session, and I'll need your help with the meaning of filled. Is it perfectionistic? Let me read the whole thing and point out what causes me to ask that question. On account of this, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled, presumingly to the brim, with knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work. Don't leave any out. Increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to the might of his glory for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. So, Father, as we try to understand these maximalist words that seem to ask for perfection, show us what Paul intends for us to understand about what he's praying for, what he expects, what's possible. Please, Father, help us in Jesus' name. Amen. So, filled all spiritual wisdom, fully pleasing, every good work, all power. This looks like perfection he's asking for, right? It looks like it. Now, why would I even balk at that? Well, I balk at it because of lots of other things that Paul says. For example, in 1 Corinthians 13, 8, he says, Love never ends. As for prophecies, they'll pass away. As for tongues, they'll cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. And further down, in verse 12, he says, Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now we know in part. Then we shall know fully, even as we are fully known. But here's the word perfect, teleon. So Paul has a view that this is not for this age, right? It's going to come in the future. For now, we, we're not that. We're not perfect now. We know in part. So when Paul prays that we might be filled with knowledge, According to this, we know in part now. There's a, there's a sense in which our knowledge in this age will always have some measure of limitation or defect to it. So that's one reason I'm hesitant to say those are perfectionistic words. Here's another reason. Here's Philippians 3.12. Not that I have already obtained this, Paul says, the resurrection. or am already perfected. Now, there's the verb form of that word teleon. I have not been perfected, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. In this life, Paul presses toward the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus when we will be in the twinkling of an eye, perfected in body and spirit. And yet, Paul uses the word perfect to describe real people. Yet, among the mature, when we translate it mature, it's the very same word, the perfect. We do impart a wisdom. And in the last chapter of Colossians, when Epaphras is praying for the Colossians, it says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature, that is, perfect, and fully assured, fully assured in all, all the will of God. So we have these two seemingly conflicting testimonies in Paul 
We don't have two authors contradicting each other. We have Paul writing in ways that seem at odds in our way of thinking. Namely, there is a future coming which will be perfect and we're not there yet. Or there's a future coming and he's not perfected yet. And yet, Paul uses the word perfect to describe some Christians. And I think Apophis is expecting this to happen. And when Paul prays it, here, may you be filled with the knowledge of his will. I think he's expecting us to do this, to be this way. And then one more clue as to how to think about it. Hebrews 9 seems to have a category of more or less perfect, which sounds just blatantly contradictory in the way we think about the word perfect, but let's read it. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places. Now, that is a phrase that most people would say we shouldn't even use, like more unique. Well, unique means there's only one of a kind, so you can't be more or less unique. Or, can you? In We, we let authors tell us how they think. We don't tell them how to use language. So, in the New Testament, you've got this concept of more or less perfect. Now, let's go back. So, what do I conclude about Paul's meaning here? He's praying that we would be filled with knowledge, that we would have all spiritual wisdom, that we would be fully pleasing to him, that every good work would be uh, done as we bear fruit, that we'd have all power and all endurance. And here's my attempt to understand what Paul is really praying for here. I think Paul recognizes that there is a perfection that we do not have and never will have in this fallen age. If anyone says he's without sin, he's a liar, 1 John 1. But there is another way to think about perfection or completeness, which is not perfect in the sinless sense or the unlimited sense, But in what sense? In the sense of, how shall we put it, being as what? Good or full? Pick out your good deed here, your fully pleasing. Pick as good uh, or full as a justified sinner with remaining corruption, like Romans 7 says, can be. And he calls these people mature or perfect. I think it's right for the translators to translate this word teleos as mature in some places to avoid confusion, because in English, the word perfect simply does not ordinarily connote that there's anything left to achieve. And I don't think that's what Paul means here. I think, I want you to be as full of knowledge. I want you to have as much spiritual wisdom. I want you to have as fully pleasing to God life as possible. I want you to do every good work, all of those, as good and as full as a justified sinner can be. We wouldn't want Paul to pray like this. I pray that you may be filled with about 70% of the knowledge available to you. And I pray that about 80% of the spiritual wisdom would be given to you and that you would be maybe 60% pleasing to the Lord. And maybe I pray that you would do, oh, let's say 85% of the good works that you are called to do, and on and on. We we don't want Paul, we shouldn't pray that way, and he doesn't want us to pray that way. And I don't think we are necessarily praying for something that we can't achieve. I don't think it's wrong to pray for perfection if you recognize that's not going to happen in its fullness in this life. 
But I doubt that Paul thought of this perfectionistically, sinlessly, without limitation. I think he meant, grant that all these maximalist words would happen in your life by God's agency as good and as full as a justified sinner can be. Pursue, pursue, and who knows what limit would keep you back. God may take you further than you ever dreamed in the fullness of the knowledge of his will. 